Hi everyone and welcome to this week's SEDS online webinar. We're really pleased to be able to offer all of our events for free and our resources for free thanks to generous sponsorship from the International Association of Sedimentologists, the IAS. This week we're really pleased to be able to welcome Jared Spitsky, um, who's going to be talking to us today about the advent of the Anthropocene Epoch. Professor Jared Spitsky received doctorate degrees in oceanography and ge geological science from the University of British Columbia in 1978 where she developed a quantitative understanding of particle dynamics across the land-sea boundary. She has a variety of appointments within Canadian universities from 1978 to 1995, and was a senior research scientist within the Geological Society Survey of Canada at the Bedford Institute of Oceanography from 1981 to 1995, and went on to serve as director of INSTAR until 2007. She has over 500 publications, including authorship or co-authorship of 65 peer-reviewed books, and has served in various editorial positions for many international journals. She received the Royal Society of Canada 2009 Huntsman Medal for Outstanding Achievements in Marine Science, is a Fellow of the American Geophysical Union, and accepted the SCPM Francis Shepard Medal in 2016, and an Honorary Doctor of Science in Sustainability from Newcastle University in 2016. Jaya works in the forefront of computational geosciences, sediment transport, and land-ocean interactions in Earth's surface dynamics. And today is going to be talking to us about the advent of the Anthropocene Epoch. Um, very, very excited for this talk. So without further ado, I'll hand over to you. Hello, everyone. This is my first uh, COVID uh, presentation. I'm not used to doing this, but let's see how it goes. So first I'd like to uh, uh, thank my co-authors of this paper. There were uh, 17 other co-authors who've written a paper that's coming out in Communications, Earth and Environment. And um, they contrib each of these co-authors contributed muchly to what you're about to see. It's a, a bit of a talk that's a, a mixture of that paper and a presentation that I gave at IAS in uh, Quebec City at the Congress. Okay. So um, let's start with what is the anthropothe Anthropocene thesis. This is a thesis that acknowledges humanity's capabilities and record of altering at the planetary scale, Earth's energy balance. And I show here a list of um, uh, various key components and all of them have been altered by uh, under the most recent climate changes that we've been going through, as well as terrestrial and marine ecosystems and geomorphic and sediment transport processes. And the idea is that these driving forces of change have been recorded with sufficient physical, chemical, and biological alterations to the Earth's stratigraphic record to herald a new geological epoch, the Anthropocene. So that's the thesis. And this presentation is to um, sort of support that with a very quantitative approach. And the Anthropocene is about humans uh, per se as the driving force. So what is it about humans that um, can lead to such a planetary scale change? And so we've, we've come up with three main uh, drivers that have led us from the Anthropocene um, towards the Anthropocene from the Holocene and they are global population, global energy consumption, and global productivity. And so these three curves are sort of interesting in that everything you see in, on the left-hand side of your screen, that takes you across much of the Holocene. And it's got one time scale below in years before present from 12,000 to 500. And then there's another expanded scale on the right-hand side of the screen that goes from 350 to the present. And you'll see that there are two circles or uh, two uh, 
pointers, uh, 1850s shown in, as a blue open circle. And then you will see a purple square that marks 1950. And you'll see reflection uh, in these uh, curves. And let me show you that. Um, let's see if I can get down to the arrow. And so there you have it um, where if you were to look at the last sort of uh, few hundred years of the Holocene, if you assume the Holocene ends in 1950, it was trucking along in 1850 that was fairly consistent from what was going on, but then something happened after 1850, 1900, and then 1950 particularly, things changed remarkably. It's like you entered a new system. And so a lot of people looked at these curves and we, we would have thought, well, this is just an exponential curve. But when you do the math on these curves, there's really two linear lines. One sort of what happened before 1950 and one that happened after 1950. And that's part of this th Anthropocene thesis. Something remarkable happened after 1950. And uh, we'll s get into that in greater detail. Okay. Another way of looking at this is that if you were to divide the Holocene into its component ages, the Greenlandian, North Gripian, Megalean ages, you'll see they're roughly, you know, uh, 3,500, 4,000, 4,200 years. And we've broken that out uh, in detail for the last few hundred years of the Megalean. We've broken out uh, the pre-industrial and the industrial. And then we put in this proposed Anthropocene starting in 1950, which is only 70 years in length. And you'll notice that the climate of the Holocene was, you know, it had some fluctuations, but they're kind of minor uh, over a 4,000 year period, you know, at the beginning in the Greenlandian, it went up about 0.5 degrees. And in the Megalayan, it was down about 0.5 degrees. Uh, not much was happening in the pre-industrial and industrial, but then it started to shoot up again in the Anthropocene and at a higher temperature than we've had during the Holocene. And sea level rise, of course, we we're coming out of an ice age, so we had a high sea level rise in the Greenlandian. And we, in the Anthropocene, is now even larger than the North Gripian in the last year or two. You will also see that the population you know, it had a small increase over a very long period of time of humans. Uh, growth rates didn't start to really pick up until the Megalayan. But they've really remarkably increased in the Anthropocene. And we've laid out here um, the various types of energy sources. And of course, today, the um, uh, our energy sources are much more um, um, greater in scope and in their ability to provide us energy. So if you looked at the general of the Holocene per capita energy use, things haven't really changed in 12,000 years. I mean, that's from 6.2 to a, an age interval average of 8.3. That's not much of a change, but you'll notice that of this 8.3 of the Megalayan, most of that change was within the last few hundred years uh, where it started to shoot up and today it's very high. And the total energy for these units, when you take humans into account to get it from per capita to total interval energy averages, you will see that the Megalayan was quite a, a large energy user of human uh, consumption. And, but of course, the Anthropocene is much larger than that, it's almost double 
if not larger than double. And you will also see that there hasn't been much in terms of economic activity until most recently. And the economic activity at the Anthropocene is just off the charts, and that's part of the story too. So if, so we were in the time out there looking across the geological time, you know, through the Holocene and into the Anthropocene. But another way to look at this is to look at it um, in terms of human population. And so uh, you can see that as human population um, was increasing, global energy use increased throughout population growth. And that's very important because again, the circle is 1850 and the square is 1950. And, and you can see for almost all of human population, it's a rather linear curve. And um, you will also notice that the per capita economic activity, GDP, uh, you'll see that it started to shoot up after uh, the industrial age began in 1850. That's this circle here. And the ratio from uh, productivity to energy consumption it was decreasing through most of the Holocene and began to shoot up since the industrial age as uh, technology and fossil fuel consumption shot up. And that resulted in a very large growth in human population after 1950. You can see that most of the Anthropocene is well over 1% in growth rate per year. And the final part of the Anthropocene thesis is that no matter what you pick in terms of looking at sort of uh, signals that would show up in the geological record, um, one way or the other, such as uh, sediment sequestration in reservoirs, you'll see that reservoir capacity of large dams is almost a, a perfect linear uh, line with global energy consumption. And that, of course, makes sense. But because global energy is so well constrained with uh, global GDP or human population, whatever we plotted global reservoir capacity with, they would all show up as a linear curve. Since all of these uh, environmental factors are so highly correlated. And the same with global atmospheric CO2, you will notice that that is uh, uh, showing up as a perfectly linear curve also with uh, global energy. And it also, you will see that plastic production or cement production track global GDP perfectly or copper production, ammonia production track human population almost perfectly. And so, these are just a few of the examples and they lead to something that I'm not going to go over in detail, but I assume that this presentation will be on uh, the website so that you can look at these numbers. But if we were to look at the detail and the transition from the industrial age, in this case uh, shown up as in 1900 and the Anthropocene showing up in 1950, you'll see that many of these parameters show a marked increase after 1950, some of them a little before 1950, but there's just no comparison that there are order of magnitude changes in uh, various parameters. One would be megacities because that's a big uh, impact on the planet. And you'll see that all these megacities just hugely changed uh, and they're the result of one of the largest migration of humans on the planet in their history. Or energy consumption. And energy consumption shows up in many ways, such as our fuel, fossil fuel, and you'll see that just remarkably how that change has occurred. CO2 emissions, atmospheric CO2 as detected in the atmosphere, uh, atmospheric uh, nitric oxide or methane, how sea level manifests 
these changes, how air temperature manifests these changes. Um, and in terms of GDP and all of its productivity, you'll see that number of motor vehicles and its impact on roadways and number of dams and their impact on sediment sequestration, uh, freshwater use, tracks population almost perfectly. Shrimp farming sort of took off after 1950. Cement production, same thing, ammonia, aluminum, copper, even mineral species has shot up dramatically uh, by over an order of magnitude. Most of these order of magnitude changes post-1950. And as a result of these changes, we're getting, and this is to a sediment community, so I can leave behind the economic stuff now, we should be looking for these changes of human interactions and their impact, in this case, on climate. And the climate shows up. Part of the hydrological cycle is um, ice. And so in Greenland, we lost around 140 gigatons per year of uh, land ice. Uh, that's um, calved off into the ocean, Antarctica about 125 gigatons per year. Sea ice volume, we're losing that at around 275 gigatons per year in the Arctic Ocean. And that's really showing up in the Antarctic these days. We can see that this temperature has progressively warmed, not only in the surface of the ocean and the land surface, but progressively to depths greater than over 2,000 meters in the ocean that atmospheric temperatures have increased um, since 1950, as we said earlier. Uh, sea level rise is now 3.7 millimeters per year. We're getting lots of uh, bleaching of reefs because of both warm temperatures and eventually it'll show up because of the acidity of the ocean. And that acidity in the ocean has shown up because the oceans are great, uh, have a great ability to absorb the CO2. And you can certainly see that absorption showing up in the Atlantic, both Northern and Southern Atlantic oceans and how that manifests as pH units changing per decade. And I've been talking about gigatons a bit. Uh, not everyone knows what a gigaton is, so let me explain. A gigaton is about 2.5 Great Walls of China. And you can see the dimensions of that, so you can sort of get your head what one gigaton means. And so we'll start with how the Quaternary differs from the Anthropocene in terms of sediment fluxes. So if we were to take the 43 petatons that have been mapped in terms of quaternary sediment mass, and you were to partition that, you know, in terms of silica classic and carbonates, uh, marine and continental, we can use that data to get a quaternary flux. So you take this 43 petatons, you multiply it by the 74% that is marine, and by the years of the of uh, the quaternary and you can get 12.6 or 12.2 gigatons per year as the flux to the ocean across all of the quaternary and you can compare that with what we know in terms of the anthropocene flux which is around 26 gigatons per year and that comes up from both rivers uh, dissolved loads particulate loads uh, suspended bed load, um, glacial contributions, mostly by icebergs these days, but as most more of the marine side of uh, glaciers and ice sheets get put on land, you'll have more of the meltwater increase and the icebergs decrease over time. High uh, alien particulates and coastal erosions have contributed to our Anthropocene flux. Then you can look at how much of this sediment is 
impounded uh, in reservoirs. And so we've, we've calculated that there is around over 3,000 gigatons of sediment or around 65 gigatons per year getting sequestered in large dams. And that's a large volume. That's a 10 meter thick deposit spread over the UK. And so you can take that value, you can add it to the Anthropocene flux, and you can get an idea that the fluxes that are being moved around in terms of sediment, what we would consider natural sediment, there's a 600% increase in over the quaternary flux. So something really radically is happening in the Anthropocene. But in addition to these changes in the natural rates, we have all these various other rates like aggregate mining, coal and its waste. They're all much larger than the ways nature moves sediment around on the planet. Cement production, other mining, so 74, 27, 50, 4.4, on and on, we've been moving these sediments around, storing it in, in reservoirs. It's, it's an amazing uh, set of uh, changes on how we've changed our planet in terms of fluxes and deposits. And this is that famous uh, movie that we generated uh, to show how dams were put on the, on, in this case, the US, you can see the migration of Western settlers across the country and the large number of dams that have uh, dominated the landscape in the US. And it's, these dams have really changed everything. So we have sediments, increasing the sediment loads by orders of magnitude through deforestation and agriculture and all these things, but we have, a, also at the very same time, we have sediment being decreased because of dams, diversions and levees and things like that. And so these two at some level cancel each other out, but they do so much more than that in terms of uh, the impact on sediment and fluxes to the coast. One of the things they do, if we were to look at that diagram, is that all of these da dark and light blue areas, these are reservoirs on, the, on a portion of the US, uh, the middle of the US, the Mississippi drainage basin, that just would not be there. These are all reservoirs, all of them. You can see the natural uh, Mississippi River and some of its oxbows around the river floodplain itself, but, and some coastal areas that show up with these coastal lakes. But other than that, all of the water bodies that are on land uh, should not be there. So they've changed the atmospheric conditions, they've changed the temperature conditions on the land, and of course they're trapping sediment. And just so that you don't think that this is a U.S. phenomenon, here's another map of the even larger dams uh, around the world and you can see uh, through the 19th century into the 20th century and around 1950, you'll see China light up uh, just remarkably. And this is the large dams from around the world. And of course, they're ponding all this sediment. So in addition to the sediment not getting to the coast, you have uh, humans doing all sorts of things to the coastal system. In Jakarta, you're dropping it by meters uh, over the last 35 years simply because you're pulling water out. Uh, that's how the, uh, most of the locals get their uh, drinking supplies in Jakarta. In the Po Delta in Italy, uh, in the 20th century, you're pulling out um, methane and ethane, and because of that, you were sinking the land. In Bangkok, huge uh, subsidence rates simply because of the growth of that mega city and the withdrawal of water. In China on the Yellow Delta, you are subsiding the land a quarter of a meter per year simply through drawing water out for fish farms and aquaculture. 
And in general, if you look at the rivers of the world, you will see that uh, their deltas are sinking at rates so much higher than sea level is rising. And so for coastal areas, it's not a sea level story. For mo almost all the coastal areas I've looked at, it's almost always a sort of an anthropogenic story. Although as sea level rates increase, they will start to show up as an effect in addition to us subsiding the land. And this map, it's a wonderful movie. Each frame is one year from the other. And it's from 1984 to the present. And they're satellite images. And you can see the Mississippi Delta literally disappearing in front of your eyes. So I'll let this play a couple more times. And so if you're a sedimentologist, you must just love the Anthropocene because the changes are remarkably fast. You can test hypotheses. And I've just always been so excited about the potential of what humans have done to the earth. I'm disappointed as a human being, of course, but as a scientist, I can look at these changes and say, wow, we are really seeing changes in front of our eyes. And in 1950 to 1999, for many areas of the world, a hypoxia was rare, but it's starting to really ke catch up and there are dead zones appearing more and more all over the world. That has a huge change on the way sediment accumulates, the, uh, the bioturbation, organisms that are being stored in the sediment um, uh, and their tests uh, through time. So big changes on that front also. So let's look at what are these Anthropocene changes compared to the Holocene? So the ones that are sort of in the 200, 300, maybe 400% range, we have atmospheric and ocean temperature, atmospheric CO2, methane, uh, N2O, global reactive nitrogen, that's fertilizer, uh, metals in the environment, such as mercury, phosphorus, sediment transport, terrestrial soil loss, and terrestrial marine biomass loss. So those are huge compared to the Holocene. But much larger are these order of magnitude variances, such as human produced energy, mineral species, concrete and aluminum metal production, species extinction, declines in river runoff. That's a whole story in and of itself. Increases in coastal hypoxia, upstream sequestration of sediment. So there, between those two, it's enormous. Plus, you have to take into account, oops, go back. Uh, plus, you have to take into account that there are things that are occurring today that have no precedent in the Holocene, such as a more acidic and warmer global ocean, global dispersal of new materials that we sort of invented in the last number of years, such as fly ash, persistent organic pollutants, plastics, pharmaceuticals, ceramics, metals, radioisotopes. Uh, biodiversity has changed in the last uh, 70 years hugely. Globally distributed invasive species is another signal that's just without a Holocene precedence. And even our earthquakes, uh, some of them at least, are having an anthropogenic imprint in parts of the world. Um, so this has led to a working group that you all know of in Leicester University, the Anthropocene Working Group um, that has run it as uh, its headquarters for um, I guess 12 years now. Uh, it is a subcommission of the uh, Quaternary uh, Stratigraphy, uh, which is part of the International Commission on Stratigraphy, and that is a unit of the International Union of Geological Sciences. And they've been looking at whether these changes have met the muster of uh, deposits and their formations and their signatures and uh, preservable signatures and how they are distinct from earlier epochs. 
very interesting side to what they're working on. And of course, they're interested in and focusing on the worldwide signals uh, rather than the local or regional signals that may show up in one part of the year, world, but don't show up in many other parts of the world. And they're looking at, for instance, in the upper part of the story, um, you know, um, maybe uh, there's some signal that's just obvious in lakes. These are lake cores where it's showing up, or maybe new minerals, or maybe rock forming deposits today that where a lot of the human artifacts are showing up. So many people have many ideas about whether they, these various deposits and locales will meet the muster in forming uh, the base for what could be considered a new uh, geological epoch uh, based on ICS standards. And so we're looking for global boundary stratotype section and point or GSSP locations. And we have a long rich history uh, in geology of how we pick different signals to muster the beginning of different epochs and ages and all of that. And so some of those signals that uh, have been looked at in terms of the identifying the Anthropocene are things like isotopes, um, maybe an iridium anomaly, uh, that would be the equivalent of all the um, um, geological um, uh, deposits around the world that pick up the radioactivity from uh, nuclear explosions. And so you lay out in this working group, you lay out all the possible environments to look for perfect environments that may pick up these signals. And then you have all these geochemical and novel material and annual uh, lamini markers um, biotic markers, and you just start populating these databases to see whether there is enough candidate sites to justify uh, using geological methods um, an Anthropocene epoch declaration. So for each one, there would be a, a, a series of signals that would be maybe could justify it. And then you would have a whole bunch of folks that would say, no, no, you can't use that. And here are the reasons why. Ultimately, you would get to the point where these for and against, you would be left with signals that you can say, ah, these are the ones that we want to use. And there was cases made for, for instance, all the nuclear explosions and the globalness of this environment. That was one study. Another one was looking at marine anoxic uh, deposits for other um, perfect sites to record the Anthropocene in. Um, as I said earlier, uh, there's a whole series of uh, lakes around the Arctic and um, um, territorial waters uh, in, around the Arctic that show these nitrogen signals uh, picked up in lakes. And oh, and you'll see that almost all of them show the 1950 as, as sort of the mid 20th century as the where you're getting the signal um, changing dramatically. And so you would lay this all out on a table and you'd have these uh, markers uh, all along the top and these environments and start looking at, well, where are we detecting these signal changes? Where are they really big ones? And some of them are 1955, another one's 1950, another one's 1940. So you, you, you can't have any sense that it's one particular date, but you look at the overwhelming evidence to see, is there enough of these sites, signals, and evidence to provide a consistent story? And this comes to our last, my last slide, which basically says that the results so far from the geologic community um, is that the Anthropocene is functionally different from the Holocene and it's stratigraphically distinct 
And together, the Anthropocene should be considered a geological epoch, if not equivalent to the Holocene, so many more times more significant than the Holocene in terms of the changes that are taking place today. We can detect the future, but just on the environment that we've uh, examined over the last 70 years, we've changed it more in the last 70 years than many thousands, if not tens of thousands, if not millions of years like CO2. Um, we've changed it dramatically and we believe this justifies a new geological epoch. So I'll end my talk there. I no longer know what the time is, so hopefully someone can help me. Hi, Joe. Thank you so much for the presentation. It's um, incredible to think, uh, you know, not just from not just from a geological perspective, but from a whole Earth system perspective, how how much the world has been impacted by having us living on it. Um, so thank you so much for that. So um, the chat is now open for questions. Um, so whilst you're typing your questions, um, I'll just let you know the form will be back next week. Uh, we've just been testing some of the plugins in the background to make sure that nothing's going to instantly crash when we try to put it back on. Um, but the forms will be back up and running next week so we can uh, post questions there if we think about them later or perhaps uh, if you're watching this as a recording you can go ahead and, and ask your questions in the forums as well and we can keep this conversation going. So um, yeah we're just seeing if there are any questions in the chat. Okay. So um, I'll ask a question to start with then, just to uh, allow, allow people a bit more time. So what do you think, um, what do you think is going to be the marker for the Anthropocene? What's your, what do you think? You're putting me on the spot, so I don't, okay. I don't, I guess I don't really know and I don't really care. Okay. Uh, that may seem kind of weird to say. Um, you know, this was laid out as a hypothesis by Paul Crutzen and uh, Eugene Sto uh, Stormer as a hypothesis to be tested. And we've been looking for the data that supports this hypothesis. And when Paul went forward with the hypothesis um, 20 years ago, he viewed this from an earth system perspective. And so we really know that we've changed the earth system. And we can, I mean, anyone who believes in science cannot dispute how much we have changed the earth system. And the question has always been, are those changes, uh, do they show up in the geological record? Now, my interest in this is looking at it from a sedimentologist's point of view, but not from a stratigrapher's point of view. And so the question will be answered by a stratigrapher, not by a sedimentologist. I've been interested in rates and rates of change and how this 20 years of human, uh, I mean 20 years, 70 years of human activity have fundamentally changed how processes have changed on the planet. Assuming that stratigraphers would get involved and look at it from a stratigraphic point of view. And I think from a sedimentologist, this is really, really rich territory, whether you're a glacial geologist, a coastal geologist, a fluvial geologist, or any of these others, where you can start looking at rates of change. Because things are changing so rapidly and so fast, we can solve just countless geological questions simply because we can clock the rates we can clock the changes, we can relate the two, and unlike most of geology where it's an interpretation, 
we can test these hypotheses and we can move geology in a way that it's never been moved before and made it a much more richer uh, quantitative science. And I just, I view the Anthropocene as sort of a, a gift from the heavens if you're a sedimentologist. Great, great answer, thank you. Um, next question then is from James Best, who says, Jaya, as always, a fantastic thought-provoking talk. Maybe a heretical question to ask in a geological talk, but given that you show so convincingly that 1950 is the date we should decide on, why do we need a GSSP site? Why can't we just date pre and post 1950? Yeah, so... <sighs> okay, uh, I, I don't know how to answer this question, so let me just uh, wax and maybe an answer will uh, uh, appear to me. When, when I was around uh, as leading one of the groups in the International Geosphere Biosphere Program that was tasked uh, 20 years ago to look at uh, when after he, uh, he, uh, Paul Crutzen had made his announcement, I was tasked to lead a group of international scientists to see whether this shows up in fluvial sediments. And, and if you remember back then, Paul suggested as the hypothesis that it was the industrial age. It wasn't 1950. And so, you know, when someone makes a hypothesis, it must be tested. And uh, you don't just accept, you test, as all science does. And so when we went into this, I went into a testing 1850 or 1800, the industrial interval as the beginning of the Anthropocene. I didn't begin testing 1950. It's just that all the results started coming back that it was 1950. And that was showing up both in atmospheric changes, changes to our um, global hydrological cycle, changes to our global energy cycle, changes to two signals in the rock record that we left behind the industrial uh, beginnings of the Anthropocene, which would have been fine for me had that, if the evidence had gone in that direction. So a number of us, including Paul himself, has have changed our initial minds based on hypotheses testing. So I think, um, I don't know, I think that we have to let the data fall where it falls and I think that the geological community needs to follow the same protocols if they're going to accept this as a new epoch. They have to accept the same protocols that were established and how other epochs and ages and eons and periods were all formed. And I think that I'm comfortable with letting science land where it may. And uh, so I think geologists need to define a base, a base. And the thing that non-geologists don't understand is that this base doesn't have to be at the very beginning of any new event or epoch or age. It has to be a global signal that's indisputable that you can see, you can go and sample and study. And it happens to be the perfect signal that one could um, advance science not necessarily the absolute beginning of anything. I think that's uh, non-geologists have fallen into that trap when they've heard about the GSSP. Great, thank you. Um, our next question is from Alexander Sims, who says, great talk, thanks. Do you think uh, we have the perspective yet to determine whether the Anthropocene is an epoch or an event like the PETM? <laughs> okay, um, so an event, let's take a, let's take a meteorite hitting the earth, you know, it, uh, it does its destruction and, um, and then, you know, the tsunamis, the clouds, the uh, darkening, um, 
all those changes, uh, changes in the biota and all of that. And then things re take a while to reestablish and you end up in a new changed environment. That's, that's sort of the event uh, signal. Rather than something that's ongoing. And if you looked at those curves, if you went, if I could quickly uh, blur your eyes and go back to something at the beginning, Uh, none of these <laughs> curves look like an event. They're continuing. They're ongoing. And if you looked at uh, the, um, the atmospheric CO2, those gases that are basically changing the energy cycle of our planet, because, uh, of course, uh, you know, the warming that's going on is literally tied into the energy system of the planet to such an extent that it will be thousands and thousands of years before we ever recover. If we were to absolutely stop all CO2, the atmosphere is still rich in this CO2 for thousands of years. You know, this the atmospheric CO2 is not simply because we continue to pump up enough CO2 to equal the amount that's already in the atmosphere, it's built in. It will, if we stopped, it's still there. Some of the other gases like methane and nitric oxide, they will recover faster than CO2, but CO2, the main driver, there, it's gonna be around for a long time. So the oceans take a fair amount of time to re-equilibrate -equil and because of that, this connection between the atmosphere and the ocean, I would say that's going to be thousands of years before we get to a state, even if we were to say, well, why don't we just deal with, um, um, uh, let's say, solar or um, wind or some other renewable energy system. We've changed the system for a very long time. so. I don't think it's equivalent to an event. I think we're actually looking at signals that seem to be just skyrocketing continuously. And we bake these things into our planet for some period of time. Okay. Um, great. Our next question is from Kira Lappe, who says, thank you for your talk. Regarding the beginning of your talk, where do the data or any energy consumption, population, et cetera, for ancient uh, and prehistoric times derived from? So where, where, do your, where does your data come from? Oh, okay. So, well, there's a couple of studies that have been published and uh, republished for, uh, and you, their data has been used for uh, a period of time. And some of the later studies basically are saying that humans left to their own devices, in other words, looking for food, um, scrounging for food and things like that, they will burn so much uh, gigajoules per day um, or gigajoules per year um, in those activities. It's, it's, it's like something you can figure out, you can experiment with. And then if you were to add in, well, what are the advantages of fire? What are the advantages of uh, maybe using animals uh, for transportation or for agriculture? You know, how much does that change our ability to uh, produce and consume energy? Um, so those studies, and they're, they're much more recent studies, those studies, um, support basically this low energy um, uh, values in terms of down here, simply because there aren't very many humans around. And uh, the humans, let's get to humans. So, 6 million, 14 million. If this was, if let's say uh, we got this data wrong, that there weren't 6 million back 10,000 years ago, but there were 12 million. It would change nothing in the study. 
If you said, well, this wasn't 12 million, this was 24 million, it would change nothing in this study. Same with all of these values. You only get to really big changes in the last few hundred years. So if, if humans had basically the same um, level of energy consumption over the last 12,000 years, then the longer time period of the, of the Holocene would win out, that it would have a value of, uh, of more importance than just 70 years of humans around. With even, this is the Anthropocene average of 5,000 humans uh, or 5,000 uh, million humans over the last uh, 70 years. We're now approaching 8 uh, billion people. So these uh, numbers are such that you've got time and energy use playing at hand. And if energy use over that long period of time did not change, then time wins out over numbers of humans. But because over a 12,000 period, we've increased our energy use, and you can see just in the last few years, an order of magnitude, then that order of magnitude change plus the humans here went out in terms of the total energy use. And that's because all through here, all this energy use here, most of it was for survival. And even with the use of fire, tools, uh, animals, you were almost always in survival mode. And when you're down in this area, the pre-industrial and into the industrial, things started to change literally because of fossil fuels, literally because you were throwing at stored geological energy into the mix. All of a sudden, you got to be able to, instead of having 70% of your energy in terms of feeding yourselves and surviving, you had 10%. That's what our survival is now, is only 10% of our energy use. That's how you can get to these numbers. And so while this date is not, you know, there's, I, don't, I would say this is weak data, weeks. Uh, there's not enough studies down here. It can't be altered to change the thesis. I've tried to play with these numbers and just saying, well, let's say it's double, let's say it's triple, let's say it's quadruple. Changes nothing in any of these studies. That's powerful stuff. Thank you. Our next question is from Noel Silby, who says, thank you for your presentation. I'm curious to know, what is the major or minor geological changes that happened to decide the new epoch Will start started in 1950. Um, major or minor? Well, um, okay, that's a good one. Uh, sedimentology and stratigraphy; those are the twins that are always beside each other in terms of stratigraphy and the geological record. Sedimentology is the processes, you know, what produces sediment, what transports sediment, and sort of how it gets deposited. And stratigraphy is, you know, like once it's deposited, does it stay there? Is it modified after it's deposited? So basic stuff. Well, importantly, in this study, it's not really things that are getting deposited and you're just getting new markers, but you're actually changing the transport mechanisms, the production mechanisms, and the rates of deposition. So all of that on sort of on the sediment side, that is a greater side of uh, the story than the post-modification stratigraphy or even just some of the basic marker signals. Now the marker signals are still important. In fact, they will become the dominant uh, importance as we get into the GSSP side of the study. Um, but the sedimentology side, the fluxes side, the transport side, those are the most important. So things that have changed uh, sequestration of sediment on land, such as diversions, um, dams, uh, uh, 
how we've changed the very nature of the landscape by subsiding huge, large land areas in the coastal zone much faster than even sea level is rising. That's a dominant signal because it affects the rate of coastal retreat. Um, so the formation of deposits and their rates and the final products, those seem to be sort of first order signals. But when it comes to GSSP, those big picture studies probably will take a secondary uh, place to the uh, refinements of stratigraphy such as changes in nitrogen and the cycles of uh, uh, lakes and their deposits or uh, radioactive uh, detection of, uh, of signals around the world, those will become more important in the GSSP world than the sedimentology will become or has become. Great. Well, our next question then is from uh, Maromatic who asks, thank you for the presentation. I would like to know what hypotheses you think it's possible to test. And that's from Chile. Uh, Mathematics and chili. So, yes. Uh, well, that's a, a really <laughs> broadly open-ended question. <laughs> um, yes. So, well, I think that I think as a sedimentologist, that's my training, and as an oceanographer, I would be. Uh, looking at this from a process point of view. So I really am not the best person to answer your question from a stratigraphic point of view. And as I said earlier, whenever you get rapid rates of change, so um, so for instance, you look at this slide and you're looking at ice. So as a sedimentologist, I can't look at the slide without thinking, oh my God, this is the perfect place to go to and look at, we now know what the rates of retreat are. We know that they're happening rapidly, that there's, it deals with lags from the atmosphere. It deals with uh, changes that are happening from climate change as well as sea level. So you've got a physical side and a chemical side and a thermal side to look at. You could look at how this will show up as changes in fjords. You can look at how this may affect uh, new uh, areas that were maybe under an ice shelf that are no longer in, under an ice shelf. I can't, or the sea ice volume, going to the Arctic to look at, well, you had sea ice there continuously. Now it's not there continuously. It's only there during the winter times. You know, what, how do these changes manifest on the sediment uh, deposits under uh, these uh, sea ice uh, Arctic um, zones? So every time I look at one of these slides, whatever one it is, I keep thinking as a sedimentologist, what does this mean? You look at thermal temperatures, you look at sea level effects, you look at effects on carbonates. And so because you know rates so well, you can start testing all sorts of hypotheses. Some of re will relate to important studies to justify the Anthropocene, but many, many, many more of these studies are just increasing our knowledge of geology and for interpreting things that are happening in the Holocene, interpreting things that are happening in the Pleistocene when we know all of the boundary conditions today. We did not know all of the boundary conditions back then. We have fabulous uh, uh, instrumentation records that document these changes. So that's how you can manifest these studies into geological studies records. And I don't know, I wish I wasn't retired because I think I could be writing a dozen papers a year. <laughs> so anyways. Fantastic, thank you. Um, our next question then is from Patrick Hansel from Erlangen, Nuremberg. And he asks, uh, is it plausible that the Holocene and Prococene border can be dated earlier at 500 BP? 500 years before present. 
Well, in this, <laughs> that's a good question. Um, I will let for the data speak for themselves. So it's not really a personal choice. I think this is one where anyone who has this kind of evidence and you're looking for a global signal, I mean, so it can't be a regional signal, like Europe is just a dot on the surface of the planet. So it can't be a European signal. It has to be a signal that is global in extent. Um, and it has to be related to the driving forces that are planetary in nature. And so some of these planetary signals did not occur like four or 500 years ago, 300 years ago. Things began then, uh, but fossil fuels didn't really get going until the 19th century. Yes, people were using coal and burning coal in the 18th century. It's true, and that's why it became part of uh, the initial industrial uh, age hypothesis. But the coal use then, compared to the coal use since 1950, it was like infant, it was much smaller in the uh, 19th century than it was in the 20th century. And so your signals may have had a beginning at a certain time, they have to be global. And I don't think anyone in the Anthropocene community would care one way or the other whether it began in 1950 or 1850 or 1750. I think you have to let the data land where it can and just remember global, global, global. Uh, I think too many uh, studies have come out with you know, really regional signals that don't stand up to hypothesis testing. But test away. I mean, whatever scientists come up with has to be rigorously tested and tested and retested. And even if the ICS was to pick the date 1950, that doesn't mean that it can't be adjusted 200 years from now and someone can say, no, 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 really, we have better techniques today. We're going to go back and change this date to 1850. There's nothing wrong with that. It's just that the data today are suggesting that it should be around a mid-century, 20th century. Great. Um, our next question from Stan Stanbrook is along those lines also. Um, says, great talk. It's interesting that the data points to the Anthropocene starting in 1950. Yet I suspect most historians would likely name the start of the Industrial Revolution sometime in the mid 1800s. I'm curious to get your thoughts as to the causes and possible learning that lag time tells us, if indeed you think there is one. Well, that's a good question. I'm going to, oh, well, maybe. So, <laughs> okay. So we've been building dams for a long time. Um, I think the first large dam um, was built, I don't have this date in my head, but I think it was in Japan and it may have been in the 12th century. I mean, it was a long time ago. If you were to look at large dams, which are the mostly responsible for the sequestration of sediment, excuse me, small dams sequester sediment also, but they fill in so fast that their ability to sequester sediment because they literally don't hold a very large volume of water to fill in with sediment. It's mostly the large dams that do, um, is the bulk of the sequestration. Anyways, these large dams um, before 1850, they only contributed a few percentage of the um, uh, reservoir capacity. And from 1850 to 1950, you know, it was just a few, few more percentage. Uh, and not even that. So I, I think the numbers are on this slide. 97.5% of the sequestration capacity of these large dams, that was since 1950. So So from a historical point of view, you will find, well, they will, a historian, and they would and they should say, well, when was the first dam ever built? But that first dam that was built in the 12th century, 
in and of itself did not lead to any geological response. It affected some little river, some place in Japan, but it, there was no global response. There was no uh, big climate change. There was no uh, series of events that led to how the planetary system changed. And so you keep looking for when did the signal really take off? So if we look at this, here we have the uh, diagram of sediment volume and it's uh, how it's being sequestered in dams with some projections into the future. And you'll see that, yes, there was a signal that predates 1950, but that signal is historical. It's not geological. It, it doesn't have a response of the big sense. So that's where historians should continue to do what they're doing because I think it's very interesting. But I, I don't think that that history can be taken out of context as the early beginning to lead to a geological uh, product in the end. Great, thank you. And next question is from Fabian Colombo, who says, thanks very much for your presentation. Uh, my question is about the Great Acceleration. If the Anthropocene begins with the Great Acceleration in the 1950s with nuclear fallout, etc., what dialogue should be opened with contemporary history and social sciences according to you? And what are the Anthropocene Working Group's perspectives on this question? Yeah, I, I, I refuse to talk on behalf of the, uh, <laughs> the Anthropocene Working Group. I am a member, but a member. Um, so, I'm putting this slide up for you to look at because of these oil wells. And I remember giving a talk on the Anthropocene um, some years ago. And, and one of the people in the audience, she came up to me later and she says, why don't you look at um, some of the things that humans have done that will be around for millions of years. And I said, what are you thinking of? And she says, uh, uh, petroleum wells. And here we have, because, you know, um, um, bioturbation is, uh, can be a signal in the geological stratigraphic community. And so organisms leave traces. And these traces can sometimes, although they're not used for GSSP markers in um, marking periods more recently, they have been used in the geological past. And so something like we have drilled more than 54 million kilometers of petroleum wells. These go deep down into the ground. They have a global distribution, particularly with IODP and ODP and other organizations that drill all over the oceans. And and so you have millions of kilometers of these signals that will last for millions of years. Well, this would be an example of a signal that is a geological signal. It will last for the requisite length of time. It largely, um, dates from 1950 when we started using more and more, ever more um, geological fossilized fuel, you know, coal and oil and gas. And so this signal in itself could be the ultimate marker, but it doesn't please anyone. So it may be, a, it may be the perfect signal from a hypothesis point of view, but it's not leading to rocks that can be studied around the world where you're looking at their layers, you're looking at their markers, you're looking at how sediment is deposited, sequestered, and uh, uh, fossilized. So that's where there, there has to be at some level, you, you have to leave some of the anthropogenic sides of the Anthropocene behind and focus on what things are um, 
satisfy geologists, not simply satisfy historians and sedimentologists like myself, because this is a perfect one. Um, thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you so much um, for, for your wonderful talk, Jaya, um, and thank you to everyone for asking great questions. Um, we're, yeah, we're, we're really pleased to, to have had you come and speak here, and, and so thank you so much for, for making the time, especially so early in the morning. <laughs> <laughs> um, You're welcome. Thanks to everyone. That's not a problem. So just to, to close off the meeting then, um, Next week's webinar is going to be called The Ugly Duckling of Coastal Environments, Microtidal Meanders and Their Deposits uh, from the Venice Lagoon in Italy. And that's going to be from Masilla Mojanassi uh, from Padova University, which is going to be a great talk. Um, in the meantime, come along to our SEDS online coffee breaks. Um, we have all the details for them up on the website, so go check it out if you'd like to come along and chat sedimentology. Um, and yeah, we, we really hope to see you uh, next week's webinar and so thank you everyone again and i'll close the meeting there thank you <laughs>